For those of you who don't know me, my name is Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog. I also host the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. And today we are talking about how to prep for the fall LSATs and beyond. So I thought I would do a little bit on study schedules over the next two months, really next two to four months, depending on whether you're taking the LSAT in September or October or November and beyond. Then we could talk a little bit about prepping for the January LSAT or later, and then just in general, general Q&A on anything at all, digital LSAT prep, LSAT and law school admissions, whatever you like, really. So just in terms of studying for the fall LSATs, many of you already know, those of you who are studying for the LSAT in my courses, you have been studying with them for a while. And very recently, I just created detailed day-by-day study plans, integrating the lesson materials with my study programs using the actual LSAT problems. So if you haven't gotten a schedule yet, if you haven't heard from me, please reach out and I will send you the appropriate schedule for your test date so you can stay on track because it really is hard to go it alone and having a plan of attack makes it so much easier. So I've sent many of you study plans already. If you don't have one but need one, of course, please let me know and I will send it as soon as possible. For those of you who don't know about study plans and what they look like, I have day-by-day ones listed here and I will share the link with you if you want to get a sense of what a study program could look like. I have week-by-week ones there as well if you want something a little bit less detailed, but oftentimes more detail is better. Now, how did I structure the study plans? What do they include? What do they involve? My study plans involve five phases, what I call the laser approach to LSAT studying, which is L for learning, A for accuracy, S for sections, E for exams and endurance, and R for review. So the first step is learning, doing problems, actually before even learning problems, just learning the theory, building your foundation first, learning about the different question types and how to approach each one. That is step one. Step two is accuracy, refining your accuracy, applying the theory to the questions, doing problems untimed, oftentimes by type, just to learn the basics. The next step is doing individual timed sections. So rather than doing questions by type, pulling it together with individual timed sections, maybe a 35-minute game section, maybe 35-minute reasoning or 35-minute reading comprehension. The point here is to move on from accuracy doing things untimed because you could get great accuracy untimed, but of course the LSAT is a strictly timed exam. And when you introduce timing, things often fall apart. So timing is really important. That's why I integrate sections, doing individual timed sections. Step four is exams and endurance, doing full length, five-section timed exams to work on your endurance. I say five sections, not four. You could do one or two four-section exams, but of course, on test day, you will be doing five sections. You will be doing the experimental section, and so integrating that is extremely important. The final phase is review, where after you do those exams, you review them untimed, taking as long as you need, to learn exactly what you were missing and why. And review is not only reviewing anything you get wrong, it's also reviewing everything you have difficulty with, everything where you guessed and were down to two choices, because of course, it very easily could have gone the other way next time around. So review is often overlooked. It's incredibly important. And when you're reviewing, you want to see, was your mistake in, let's say, logical reasoning? Was it in the stimulus? Was it in the question stem? or was it in the answer choices? If it was in the stimulus, was it that you misidentified something about the argument, maybe how it was structured? If it was the conclusion, the evidence, sub-conclusion, counter-premise, all those different technical parts of the argument, maybe you misidentified them. It could be useful simply as an exercise to go through several logical reasoning stimuli and just ID, is this premise, aka evidence? Is this conclusion? Is it sub-conclusion? Is it filler and irrelevant? Is it counter-premise? Is it just background information? Whatever it may be, 
it's important to go through that process. And oftentimes with students, they're not correctly identifying the conclusion versus the evidence, especially when there's no indicator words. It can, it can get tricky. And so it's worth taking the time to slow down, making sure you're proper, properly understanding what you're dealing with. Next, if it was the question stem and you misidentified something there, you want to make sure you are properly, properly identifying the key indicator words that tell you which question type you're dealing with. So a lot of times, this, of course, especially for necessary assumption versus sufficient assumption questions, they both use the word assumption, but it's important to tell the difference because they were asking you for very different kinds of things. Just as an example here, it's not the word assumption that tells you which type it is. It's the key verb in the question step. Verbs that are synonymous with necessity, like depends upon, requires, and assumes, indicate necessary assumption. Verbs that are synonymous with sufficiency, like allows or enables, or phrases like properly inferred if assumed, or properly drawn if assumed, tell you sufficient assumption. And of course, there are many different types of questions. I'm not going to exhaustively list every single one, but my point is that it's worth as a drill, as an exercise, making sure that you are properly identifying which question type you're dealing with so that you'll be in a better position to solve that. Finally, if your mistakes in the, que- in the answer choices, you want to see what was tempting about the wrong answer choice that made you pick it and what ultimately makes it wrong and what is discouraging about the right answer that pushes you away from it and what ultimately makes it correct. This takes a lot of time. If you are getting 10 questions wrong or more, this could take three to four hours minimum because even if you got 10 questions wrong, that's a 170 approximately, which is awesome. But then there's still another 10, 15 questions that you guessed on or were not 100% confident in and, or they very easily could have got, gone the other way. And so even if you're getting a 170 on your practice tests, you've got 25 questions to review or more. And 170 is top 3% of test takers, 97th percentile. Most people by definition are doing worse than that. And so you're going to have probably closer to 25, 30, 35 questions to review for every single exam that you do, which is why as part of your study routine and in my study plans, I never have you doing exams on consecutive days, ideally no more than two timed exams per week. And if you're busy, if you're working, or if you're in school, especially this fall, if you're taking the exam in September, October, November, you're probably going to be in school in September, if not beyond for the remainder of the semester, of course, overlapping with your LSAT studying. One exam per week is probably all you're realistically going to be able to do, which means that one exam, that's going to take you about three hours or three and a half hours in one sitting, plus another three and a half to four hours to review that exam that's seven, eight hours of LSAT studying already, aside from any other work that you, that you do, whether it's watching my videos, listening to my podcasts, doing more practice problems by type, using other resources, whatever it may be, reviewing weak areas. And so if you've got other obligations, 15, 20 hours a week is probably the maximum that you're going to be able to invest in your LSAT studying. And so if you're looking at my study plans, the ones I sent out recently, the ones I, I linked to just here, that's a lot. I ask a lot of students and that's how they get extraordinary results. But if you can't do everything I ask for in my study plans, that's okay. Even if you do half of that or three quarters of that, at least you have a plan of attack going forward on how to use all the various resources. Because the last thing you want to do is just take exam after exam after exam and measure your results and be happy or sad about those results and move on. The real work is not in taking the exams or doing the problems. It's in the review process afterwards. And if you're retaking or you might have a retake in your future, don't worry about having used up all the exams ever released or all of the most recent exams released. Because again, the value is not in doing the exams. It's in learning from your mistakes. And so if you're doing exams, let's say you've done everything in the 60s and 70s and 80s and you're thinking, what do I do now? The stuff from the 50s and earlier is too old. Well, first off, the stuff in the 50s and prior is not too old. More recent is obviously better, but these are still in the modern format. They are 
virtually identical to the current stuff with very small changes, very small differences. And again, the value is in learning from the material, not simply to measure your results. If you haven't exhausted everything in the 60s, 60s through 80s, that's great. I would suggest saving a handful of those, minimum three to five, ideally more than that for a potential retake. Because if you're, t- if you're taking the LSAT in September, as I know many of you are, you still have the October and November LSATs just one and two months after that. And so it would not be that much additional effort to study for retakes in October and November as well. There's only a four-week gap approximately in between each of those LSAT test dates. And so you've only got to stay fresh on the LSAT for another four weeks in order to retake it. And through nothing more than luck alone, you could do three to four points better. And maybe you'll do worse. Maybe you stay the same. And ideally, if you improve your understanding, you'll do even better than that. But through luck alone, there's a margin of error of three and a half points on either end. So if, not, if just through luck alone, you do three to four points better, that could lead to thousands of dollars in scholarship money or getting into a better law school. And law schools only take the highest score. They don't average scores. Even if they say they consider multiple, US News rankings only take the highest. Law schools only have reason to take the highest. This is what they do. And so there's really very little or no downside to retaking other than your LSAT registration fee and having the LSAT as part of your life for an additional four weeks or so. So it is well worth it, really very limited downside. And since the July LSAT has now passed us, I know all of you are taking the LSAT in the fall or beyond, or you just like hearing me talk about the LSAT and you're here for the reason you have nothing else better to do. So I'm assuming you're taking the LSAT this fall, which means that it's worth taking multiple out of those test dates. If you're taking September, consider October as well. If you're taking October, consider November as well. And if you're taking November, consider taking October in addition or January in addition. There's obviously a a larger gap between November and January, but the plus side there is that you have Thanksgiving break, you have winter break if you're in college, or you have the, at least you have the holidays, Christmas to New Year's, likely off from work. No, not too many other obligations. Things often slow down that time of year. So maybe it's worth considering a retake then also. Now, the question then that comes up is, well, isn't applying earlier better on average? What about law school deadlines? What about early decision? What about rolling admissions? Well, first off, early decision, I think is not worth it for the vast majority of applicants. The key reason being that it kills your negotiation power when it comes to scholarships. Merit aid is huge in law school admissions. Very few people are paying sticker price tuition, meaning very very few are paying the full price of law school tuition. Most people are getting some kind of scholarship money. And listen, if you've already been through undergrad, you already have undergrad debt or your family does, or you just don't want to take on graduate school debt for whatever reason, because hey, money is good to keep in your pocket, right? Law school merit aid is all based on negotiating power. And that typically comes from having an LSAT score or a GPA above the median of the law school to which you are applying. If you just Google LSAT GPA calculator, you'll find on on LSAT's website, a a calculator where where you can input different LSAT scores different GPAs and see what your odds are like. And if if your numbers are above the median for a given law school, they will likely be willing to give you scholarship money in order to woo you or lure you to their law school in particular. But if you apply early decision, that means that you are obligated to go there if you are accepted. And so that you really just lose all your negotiating power. What you want to do is ideally have multiple offers of acceptance from multiple law schools. And then you can play them off each other. Say, hey, school X offered me 10,000 a year. You're only offering me 5,000 a year. Can you at least match or ideally exceed their offer? And hopefully the numbers are even higher than that depending upon your LSAT score. And it's crazy, but even just a single point more can lead to getting a yes versus no or getting another five or $10,000 a year or more on top of that. And so it's crazy, but there's an element of luck here, which is why, again, retaking is well worth doing. One other thing you want to look out for with law school scholarships is whether they're conditional based on you being in a certain percentile in your law school class. One thing a lot of law schools have done, which I think is kind of sneaky, is 
they'll offer a scholarship to half the entering class saying, if you are in the top third of the class, we will give you scholarship money. But if you're not in the top third, you don't get that money. Thing is they offer that to half the applicants and everyone thinks they're the special snowflake who's going to be in the top third. But of course, reality check, approximately 70% of those people are not going to be in that top third and they're losing out. And so of course, law school's tough. If you're not in the top third, that's not necessarily a reflection on your aptitude or anything. Just law school's hard. And if you have other obligations, that's the reality. But ideally, you want your scholarship offers to be unconditional, not based on necessarily how you perform relative to others in your class, given that law school grades, of course, are curved. So when it comes back, to, just bringing back to LSAT for a moment, looking towards this summer, this fall, you want to be thinking in your study timeline, of course, aside from what's laid out in the study plans is what are your other obligations? What vacations might you be taking? Are you going away for a week or a month? Of course, we're in July now, August rapidly approaching. That's the month of vacations. So if you're going on vacation or if you're going out of town, make a decision. Are you going to take your LSAT prep books with you or not? Are you going to have them on the beach or when you're with family or you're just taking a break? Where, whatever you decide, just decide on it and stick to it. Personally, I'm more inclined towards keep studying. It's worth it. Even just a little bit a day makes a big difference. If you're going to the Caribbean, if you're going on a beach vacation, maybe just knock out a half hour or an hour in the morning, get it out of the way and be done with it. But it is worth having a certain level of consistency because once you break that pattern of studying, it's easy to let one day turn into three, turn into five. Then you get back from your vacation, you're back at work, work is busy or school is busy if you're taking summer classes or just back in the fall. It's hard to get back on the wagon and then you lose the momentum. So it's really worth sticking with it ideally. But on the flip side, it is a marathon, not a sprint. So if you feel guilty about not studying, then you get back to it. Don't try to catch up on everything in one day or in one week. The schedules are more important for the level of specificity about what to do than the particular day by day or week by week breakdown. And so catch up bit by bit. Maybe do, let's say if you're, if you're a few days behind, do a three days worth of work in two days or five days worth of work in three days, but don't try to do seven days worth of work in one single day. It's just too much. And in terms of how to carve studying out of your day, if you have other obligations, carve it out if you're working before work, during lunch, or after work. Ideally, get to work early, find a conference room at work or a coffee shop nearby and knock out an hour or two before work starts. Carve out time during lunch. If time at work is slow, or you can at least do stuff online, you could watch my videos or listen to, the, listen to the podcast or read my articles, just consume some LSAT material while you're on the clock. And then after work, before you get home, before you leave work and go home, try to knock out another hour or two. But once you get home from work, once you get into your comfies, it's really hard to have the motivation to study, especially when it's later in the evening already and you have roommates or family or significant others, or even just Netflix and takeout to distract you it can be hard to actually crack open the books then. But while you're in work mode, while you're in your work attire, it's much easier to stay focused typically. Now, if you're in school, treat it at least like it's a six credit class, if not more. And it's kind of funny because your LSAT score weighs more heavily than your GPA in law school admissions, but you earn it over the course of, it weighs less heavily than the LSAT in law school admissions, but you earn it over the course of three to five years. The LSAT's more important than the GPA but you earn it only in a single day or multiple days if you're retaking. And so it is worth making the time investment in your LSAT studying. And people really do underestimate how long this takes. I typically recommend at least five to six months to reach your fullest potential on the LSAT. Three to five months is, of course, is more realistic for most folks, but not less than three months ever. Two to three months is really not enough. I do recommend more than that. And so if you've been aiming for September, again, I would suggest October or November as well, just to add a little more time to your timeline, to your runway. And if you take multiple, that's totally fine. But I would suggest for most of you, consider November at least, because it will give you a longer time frame. It's about four months from now, which is a good chunk of time. And I know that most, if not all of you, have been at it for a little while. You're not starting from scratch, but it is worth giving yourself that timeline if you need it. And 
coming back to the rolling admissions question, anything pro taking the, any time up to November is considered early in the law school admissions timeline in terms of your application. If you take the November LSAT and apply once you get your score back, that is still considered early. Anything into 2020, you know, going into the, ne into the January, February, March, that will be a little bit on the average to late side, which means that it might be marginally tougher to get in and, of course, less scholarship money available. But any time you take the LSAT this fall, if you apply once you get your score back, that is still perfectly early and should not really hurt your odds at all. And there sh still should be plenty of scholarship money available. Now, I've done a lot of other classes already on digital LSAT prep in particular, so I'm not going to go into too much depth on it. But I will say definitely worth practicing with all the tools you have available on LSAC's website, familiar.lsac.org. They have placed three practice LSATs in the digital format, and they will be releasing more in the lead up to the fall, they say. Right now, there are exams 71, 73, and 74 on there in the digital format, which means that you can play around with them using a tablet. So I do recommend practicing at least a couple of those, at least those three, with a tablet. If you already have a tablet, whichever tablet you have is probably perfectly fine. LSAC is using a Microsoft Surface Go 10-inch tablet. You don't need to have that one in particular. Again, any tablet will do, whether it's an iPad, a Samsung, perfectly fine. I would suggest getting a, a, a stylus. You can get a stylus on Amazon for under $10, I believe. And again, I would suggest getting a 10-inch tablet specifically. There is the Amazon Fire tablet, HD 10. That's around $150. And so that could be a good option if you don't have one. And of course, Amazon does have a pretty liberal return policy on tablets. So if you decide that you don't like it, you could always return it after the LSAT. Now, I've said a lot. I have plenty of other things I could cover, but I do want to make sure I'm addressing your questions and your needs. So if you have any questions, please feel free to use the chat function here and type your questions and I'll be happy to address them. Got someone asking about the Khan Academy practice tests. So if you're looking for tests in the digital format, or at least tests that are freely available, aside from the three on LSAC's site, which are again, 71, 73, and 74, which are fairly recent, good to use, and they're in the nice interactive digital format with all the features there, like highlighting, underlining, annotation, and so on. There are also several tests available on Khan Academy site. I do have a list of them here I can share with you. And so they are all fairly recent. There are, most of them are from the 60s and 70s, at least one from the 80s as well. I don't think they're in the interactive tablet format, but they are digital. They are online. And so if you want tests on the, on the screen, those are great to use. And if you want to at least simulate the digital format a little bit, if you have the PDFs, you could have them up on your computer screen, have your scratch paper on the side and, you, and use that to at least kind of mimic the idea that you're, that you're not writing directly on the questions themselves. A few other questions here that I want to address that are not related to this, but if you have any other questions that are related, please do let me know. I'm just copying them from the Q&A into the chat here. So we've got one question saying, if you're seriously panicking but have been studying for a while, how do you tame your test anxiety and fear? Great question. This is incredibly important because people do experience test day drops. You could have a situation where you are performing at one level on your practice test. Let's say maybe you're getting a 165 or 170 on, test day, on your practice tests. Then test day, you drop three to five points or more. This happens for a variety of reasons. One of them is not properly simulating test day conditions, but another is nerves and anxiety. And I always say this and people don't always take it seriously, but mindfulness meditation and focus training is extraordinarily useful. Even just three to five minutes a day of focusing on your breath or using a guided meditation, closing your eyes, makes an enormous difference over a period of time. And you have enough time right now. You have two months till September and more for the test beyond that to make a big difference in reducing this anxiety. And so if you can train yourself to focus on a single thing, either a mantra or focusing on your breath, that can make an enormous difference over time. And the reason this relates to LSAT prep or really any standardized test prep, any timed setting where you have to perform while the adrenaline is rushing through your head and your blood is pumping, 
what you do is you train yourself to bring yourself back to the task at hand, even while your mind, your, your, your kind of your monkey mind wants to race and go elsewhere. So it's not about staying perfectly focused on your breath or perfectly focused on the task at hand because none of us are perfect. Our minds do race, our thoughts do go elsewhere. And so the, the task here is to bring yourself back to the focus on the task at hand, whether it's focusing on your breath or focusing on the difficult LSAT problem in front of you, or to recognize that you're getting bogged down on that question, having the mindfulness to realize, hey, I'm getting bogged down, I'm getting stuck in this logical reasoning quicksand, and I'm not able to make any headway on it, I'm just getting stressed that I can't understand it. What you do in that situation is you recognize, I'm getting stuck, you acknowledge and recognize the difficult situation that you're in, and you know, okay, I'm going to let go of this question I'm going to flag it and come back to it later. The digital also actually has a really cool flagging feature in it so that you can see at a glance all the questions you flagged to know that you can come back to them easily later with one click or one tap of the stylus. So that's the biggest thing I would say that anyone can implement immediately. Of course, you can just sit and focus on your breath three to five minutes a day. There's also a lot of great meditation apps out there these days like headspace and calm there's guided meditations on youtube you can use as well really useful any of them i think would be fine just play around with them and see what you like best the other thing i would say is actually articulate for yourself your best case and worst case scenarios three to five years from now if the lsat goes well on your scheduled test date or if it doesn't go well obviously best case scenario is great top 14 or top five law school, full ride or tons of scholarship money. Worst case scenario, if this LSAT test date does not go well for you, let's say you're registered for September, two months from now, what is the worst case scenario if that test doesn't go well? Well, you've got October available. You've got November available. You have January. There's, they're offering the LSAT nine, 10 times a year now. So there are plenty of opportunities to retake. And you can always delay a test cycle if you need to and apply one year later. Obviously, that would suck. But in the grand scheme of things, would it really be that big a deal? Over the if you look at it kind of zoomed out over the course of your entire career, one year may not make an enormous difference. So just keep that in mind. Other questions here. If you apply for GRE schools first, then LSAT schools, will the LSAT score count, count for schools that you applied to before you get an LSAT score? Let me think on that for a minute. Will the LSAT score count for schools you applied to before you get an LSAT score? I'm not really sure how to make sense of that exactly because if the schools are evaluating you with your GRE school, GRE score, they wouldn't know you're taking the LSAT and they wouldn't even be able to consider it. They might make a decision on you before you actually got an LSAT score. So I think the GRE score would be the determining factor there. I'm not too familiar with all the details on GRE applicants because there's such a small percentage of people. Actually, less than 5% of applicants were accepted or were at least matriculated at law schools with GRE scores. I spoke with a few admission officers about this. I spoke with Rob Schwartz at UCLA and Kristen Mercado at UC Davis. I had some discussions with them, and both of them told me that they took less than 5% of applicants with GRE scores. And so it's not really that significant as a factor yet, although I know, of course, more and more schools are taking GRE scores. But they're really more for applicants who have a unique career background or something else unique to offer. I think the typical law school applicant majoring in a humanities background like poli-sci or English or pre-law or criminal justice, they really do want to see an LSAT score from most people because they want to see that you have the ability to do well in law school. And LSAT scores are strongly correlated with 1L grades and GRE scores, at least in my opinion, don't have the same demonstrated correlation with the same degree of confidence. One thing you should know about applying with GRE and LSAT scores is that let's say you take the LSAT and you don't do well on it, then you take the GRE. Law schools will consider you with your LSAT score as well. So if you got like, let's say you got a 140 on the LSAT, then you get a top score on the GRE, that 140 on the LSAT will hurt you. And so it is worth retaking the LSAT if you already took and got a low score just so that you can apply with a much better score in the future. 
So I hope that addressed that question. Feel free to ask a follow up if I didn't fully get at what you were what you were asking. We got one question here. Do you recommend applying to law school right after undergrad or taking time to build your resume and then applying? Ultimately, it doesn't really matter that much. I would not restructure your life and your delay at law school or not based on what law schools will want. I say apply when you want to go, apply when you feel ready. I don't think they have a huge preference for one over the other. There are pros and cons to each. You apply straight from undergrad, you're more in an academic mindset and more likely to have an easier time hitting the books. If you've been out of, at least that's my, that's my intuition. If you've been out of school for a couple of years, could be hard to get back into it, but having the demonstrated work experience and maturity could help you as well. So I'd say there's pros to each Just apply based on where you're at. Got one question. When you review, how long should you try to figure it out before you look at the answer? 15 minutes, 20, 30, one hour. When should you surrender and just look at the answer and look at explanations and so on? That's a great question. I think it really comes from when you are not making any headway, when, you, when, you're, not, when you're getting bogged down, when you're stuck in quicksand and your investment in time is not leading to any progress. One thing you could do, of course, is attempt the question, then leave it alone, come back to it later, try it again even a week later, a month later, and see if anything changes for you. There's the blind review technique where you try it timed, then try it untimed, and see if your results might differ. And there could be some insights to gain from that as to whether your difficulty on a question is the timing or just the, the accuracy itself. I assume that based on your question here that you're talking about doing it untimed. And I'd say it's really just based on when you're, when you're not making headway anymore. So if it's a logical reasoning question, could be three to five minutes. If it's a game, could be 15, 20 minutes. But I assume with a game or a pa- reading comp passage, at least, you're making some progress through the game or through the passage. But there could just be certain questions that are not making any sense for you. And so at a certain point, you do want to eliminate the ones that you can confidently eliminate, pick from those that remain, but also note that you were guessing versus confidently choosing a choice. You could even rate your confidence level on a scale of one to 10 to see how certain you were upon reflection later to see if you're confidently choosing wrong answers, which is really not good, or at least you know that you don't know something. The only thing I would say is that if you are rating things on a scale of one to 10 for your confidence, don't ever choose the number seven because the number seven is the cop out number. This is kind of the in-between where you're kind of confident, but not really. Make a decision about your confidence. Either you're kind of guessing randomly and it's it's a, a one or a zero, or you're down to two and it's a five out of 10, or at least you're fairly confident and it's eight or above. Mariana is asking, how can we simulate the digital LSAT with paper exams? Great question. Ideally, if you can get access to the PDFs, that does make a, a big difference to have them on screen. But if you don't have access to the PDFs for whatever reason, what you could do is keep your books clean and write on scratch paper on the side. You will get scratch paper on the digital LSAT, even though the July LSAT has happened. LSAT is still not confirming the exact number of pages that they give you for a scratch paper, but it is a booklet. It is eight and a half by 11. It is around 12 to 14 pages of scratch paper, which is not unlimited, but it is a good amount. That should be more than enough for most people if you write fairly neatly and don't write too big. So I'd say keep your books clean, use the scratch paper. And the nice thing about keeping the books clean is that makes it very easy to redo questions later too. Highlighting, underlining the annotation tools on the digital LSAT familiarization site, I think are not especially useful. So I wouldn't worry too much about learning to use those. Your mileage may vary, of course. Practice with the digital LSAT site, familiar.lsat.org. If you want to at least see what those tools are like, maybe they'll work for some people. I didn't think they were that great. And I thought they were, took more time than was, than was warranted to make it worth using them. So I would say just basically keep your practice problems clean, use your scratch paper to the side, and that's really the only major difference you need to have. The other thing I would say is that you, do, you are only able to see one question at a time on the digital LSAT. You can't see a full two-page spread of logical reasoning questions or an entire game or an entire passage at once. So you might cut out a hole in a piece of paper and overlay that on top of your LSAT book 
to limit your field of vision to a single LSAT question at a time. That could mimic it a little bit. I don't think you need to overly stress about this, but it is something to be ready for. And I think the best thing to, to do is simply to use the tests in the digital format, like test 71, 73, and 74 on LSAC's site. And then that will make it at least, that will help you get more ready for what you're going to face on test day. Got a question here on LSAC fee waivers. I have an LSAC fee waiver that expires in early 2020. Can I renew it? Or is it once per lifetime only? Good question. I don't know the answer to that, honestly. I would suggest emailing LSAC at lsacinfo at lsac.org to ask about that. And by the way, for those of you who have any questions at all for LSAC, I would email them at lsacinfo.lsac.org and email them sooner rather than later so you have time to hear back from them and time to implement any answers they have for you. Someone's asking about the, the lack of line references on the digital LSAT. They're saying July test takers experienced a no line reference question. Is that something LSAC is acknowledging as its new question formatting? Great question. So yes, one thing to be aware of with the digital format for reading comprehension is that they are no longer using line references. The lines are no longer numbered on the digital LSAT. And the reason for this is that on the digital LSAT, they have the ability to increase or decrease the text size, like the font size. And by increasing or decreasing text size, you automatically change how the, the words spill over to the next line of, of that line on, on the tablet. So for that reason, because it's kind of mobile friendly and kind of interactive, the line numbering would not be consistent if someone changed the size of the text. And so yes, going forward, there will no longer be line references on reading comprehension. So what that means is that what they will do instead is they will highlight a key word or key phrase they are referencing. It will be highlighted on the digital LSAT and it will also be highlighted on the passage itself, whether it's the question or the passage, it will be highlighted. And so that will be the case going forward. That is the new question formatting. And so if, in your prep test books, if you have line numbering, that's the analog to that versus the new digital format where it'll be highlighted instead. We've got one question here asking, let's see, I'm currently under review for getting accommodations, which would be time and a half. If this goes through, should I keep with the current pacing of 35 minutes and consider the extra time, the extra 50% time as a fail safe or implement a slower strategy throughout the section? Great question. And so that's another thing, talking about doing things early, like if you want to email LSAC early with any questions, also apply for accommodations early because it does take time for them to get back to you. And so I would say, practice with the time constraint that you will have on test day. Now, you don't currently know whether you'll get accommodations or not, but LSAC has grown more liberal with granting accommodations in recent years. And so if you have the, the appropriate documentation, if you have a history of, of accommodations, then you've got a good shot. And so I would say, assuming that you will get accommodations, practice with the time and a half you should always hope to have a buffer or a time bank as, as your fail safe of a couple of minutes, ideally. My goal for my students is that you will have at least three to five minutes at the end of every single section to go back and tackle the tough questions that you flagged earlier. But I wouldn't aim to complete the entire section in 35 minutes if you're going to have 53 minutes per section on test day. So I would, on average, slow down to meet the 53 minute time constraint, but also aim to have a buffer of a few minutes to come back at the end later. Got another question, a follow-up on the LSAT versus GRE. The question is, would law schools have to report the LSAT score of students who applied at a time when they only had a GRE score? Interesting, so that's asking kind of, if you applied and let's say you were accepted with a GRE score, then later you took the LSAT would they have to report your LSAT score to the American Bar Association? And then would that be considered, of course, in the U.S. news rankings? That's a great question. Wow, I have to look into that because I don't know the answer. My guess is that they would have to report it because that is the part, part of part of that comes back to the American Bar Association reporting requirements. They ask law schools to submit detailed profile info on all matriculating applicants, and so I, I would guess that if schools had had that information they would have to provide it to the American Bar Association, but I can't actually give you an answer on that. So 
if you email me, I will get, I will get back to you on that once I have the chance to look into this on my end. Got a question here. Where do you get the June 2019 LSAT exam in either PDF or paper format? Amazon keeps saying it is pre-sale. Yes, Amazon is always unpredictable with their release of, of new exams. It was supposed to come out even before the July LSAT. Of course, the June LSAT has not yet come out, but I am fairly confident and I would bet a decent chunk of money that it will be out by September. This is, of course, going to be numbered as test 87, prep test 87. And so those of you taking the LSAT this fall, I would not worry you will have plenty of time to complete LSAT 87 before your fall LSAT. And if you need it in PDF, a lot of prep companies are offering it in the digital format, in PDF format. And so that would be a way to get it if you want to get it faster and you don't want to wait for the print version from Amazon. Got a question here. How many prep tests should you ideally take before test day? I would recommend at least 10. At least 10 timed exams under realistic test day conditions. This is to help you build your pacing and your endurance and to fully be simulating test day conditions. And you have enough time right now before the fall that you could, you could do that pretty easily. You could do even just one a week between now and September would allow you to reach 10 comfortably. So that's my, that's my general framework on that. More is better. If you could do 15, if you could do 20, that's amazing but I wouldn't overly stress about doing 15 or 20. 10 should be enough at least, but you do want to get to the point where the official administered LSAT that you take that counts is like just another prep test. So if you're doing exams 80, 82, 84, 86, and you're saving the odd number ones for a retake potentially, you could do test 86 like a couple of days before your LSAT and then take 88, which is the, the September LSAT, take that for real on test day and have it be just another one in the routine where you've built this rhythm, you've built this habit of sitting down, doing five sections with only a, a break between sections three and four. And it's, it's, it becomes rote for you where it's nothing special anymore. And that could hopefully reduce the anxiety and the adrenaline just a little bit. Got a question on reviewing here. I'll, I'll add it to the chat here so everyone can see. When reviewing, how far should you review a question before moving on? Should be after you've understood both the wrong and right answers or after this plus understanding the complete process getting there. Honestly, I think it's about everything. It's about, it's about the wrong and right answers. And it's also about the process. The process is what ultimately matters, I think, in the end, because you've got to be able to take a question that you've gotten wrong and understand the tempting wrong answer, the discouraging right answer, how LSAC laid the traps there. It's almost as if, they write five correct answers for every single question. Then they tweak four of them just a little bit to make them wrong. So you've got to see what those little tweaks were to make the wrong answers wrong so you can avoid falling for those tricks in the future. But of course, it's not all about the wrong answers. It's also about the maybe confusingly worded question stem or it's about the confusing stimulus itself. And so when we talk about the process of solving a question, it's about all the different pieces involved. Maybe it's about how you simplified or dumbed down the stimulus for yourself to make it easier to understand. Or if it was about quickly identifying the question type you were dealing with in the question stem, or it was about just spotting those little tweaks and tricks in the wrong answers, or was about how they even tweaked the right answer to make it seem unappealing. So to me, it's about the entire process. And it is worth keeping an error log of every question you ever got wrong. And also, every question you ever had difficulty with or were guessing on and maybe got it right but just got lucky. And it could have easily gone the other way the, the, other, the, other way the next time around. You pull all of those together and you review them every week or every month. And you keep redoing them. But not just, not just kind of out of a, out of habit. You're really engaging with those questions so that you can avoid making those same mistakes in the future. Because obviously it's never about dinosaur extinction or heart disease or climate change or car accidents, whatever it may be. It's not really about the topic. Even when you get things wrong, it's never about the topic. Even if you don't like science, you don't like philosophy, whatever it is, because if you could have a conversation with someone on that topic, 
it wouldn't be nearly as difficult. It's really just being in that tightly jam-packed logical reasoning stimulus, for example, or that confusingly worded reading comprehension passage, and knowing it's an LSAT problem and that it's multiple choice and that the stakes are high because it's the LSAT. It's never about the topic. It's about the structure and the tricks that they use. And they will very commonly, always really, they will repeat a method of reasoning in disguise with a different topic. And so to me, that says it's about the abstract. It's about the structure. It's about the process. And so I think really spotting those patterns in your mistakes is key to avoid making them in the future. And that's, again, about the process. So you got a question here on, on LSAT and law school admissions forums, how to best make use of those. So I'm actually not sure if you're talking about like online forums, like message boards, or the LSAC law school admissions forums that LSAC organizes. So for those of you who don't know, actually, LSAC regularly organizes law school admissions forums, like admissions fairs, where they have law schools coming and having tabling and handing out brochures and pamphlets and flyers. And it's really a great way to ask your questions directly to admission officers and interact with them because they are human beings and ask them your questions and get answers in real time. And also build, have them start building a file on you where you can start making a good impression where you show up dressed up all nice and you have your, your resume and your business card and you get their business card and you can follow up and send a thank you via email or even a handwritten thank you down the line. Really useful to do. I saw one good tip from Emily who's actually in class right now talking about how she got those little uh, mailing address labels and brought them to uh, those fairs and was leaving them on the form because your handwriting is obviously never as good as a typed label would be. And so that could be a good way to make a good impression on them already. And then when it comes to the online message boards and forums, I would say, honestly, they could be useful to find a study partner or something like that, but I wouldn't spend too much time on there. It's much more valuable to spend time actually studying than to spend time reading about studying on a message board, whether it's Facebook or Reddit or something else altogether. Don't read about studying, just actually study. For every five hours people spend on message boards, they spend one hour actually hitting the books because obviously the internet's more engaging and addictive than an old LSAT prep test book is, but the work happens with the books, the work happens with the problems or at least resources around the problems. But message boards and forums and Facebook groups are just really more waste of time than anything else. So I would say find a study partner if you want, but then get off the internet and focus on the prep materials themselves. Other questions here. Let's see. What to write about for the law school diversity statement. That's really about what you bring to the table. So if you are from an underrepresented group, if you're from a minority group or non-traditional in some way, of course, talk about that, cover that, if you don't fall within a traditional or at least underrepresented minority group in admissions, you still can talk about something unique that you bring to the table. I've heard stories of people talking about unique hobbies they have and writing addenda or essays about that. It could be anything at all, really. It's just about what you bring to the table that's unique that others do not bring. Of course, this could be a personal statement topic, but it also could be a diversity statement topic. And so if you have multiple things to write about, consider whether one particular thing might be more suitable for a diversity statement and other things might be more suitable for a personal statement. If you have things to address related to discipline or character and fitness, I wouldn't make that the focus of your personal statement. I would save that for the character and fitness disclosure in particular and keep it very brief and matter of fact. Don't ever talk about how you were previously on the wrong side of the law. So now you want to be on the right side of the law as an attorney. Definitely not a good way to go. It's not cute. They don't like that. They don't like jokes about character and fitness. Keep it brief, succinct, maybe a single paragraph, maybe one or 200 words stating that you made a mistake, you learned from it, you won't do it again, and you're ready to move on on with your life and just leave it at that. But don't harp on it too much. Don't make excuses. Don't, Don't have a laundry list of everything you've ever done wrong if it's not necessary. Look at the precise wording of the character and fitness question and ask for help if you're not sure about it because these, the wordings do vary a little bit from school to school. And if you're ever in doubt, do make sure that you disclose because you don't want this to come back and bite you later. A lot of times people are not fully upfront with what happens with regard to character and fitness. Like if they had an arrest or a conviction or disciplinary action, 
And then later when they're going before the bar, if they were not fully honest in answering your law school application questions, and, and they actually do look at your law school application answers when you go before the bar and they see whether your answers match up with the truth. And you don't want to go through three years of law school only to have that undisclosed conviction hurt you in the end. If this relates to, let's say you were drinking underage in college and got a, a citation for it, that will not keep you out of law school. They don't care that much about it, but they do want you to be honest about it. Just say, I made a foolish indiscretion or a foolish mistake when I was young. I did not repeat it. I went through whatever necessary disciplinary action there was, and I, I learned from my mistake. And that's, that's pretty much all they want to hear, that you are mature, you've grown since then, and you've learned from your mistakes. Got a question. Which LSAT prep books do you think are the best? I don't have a single answer on this. I think different things work for different people. The one constant I would say you want to make sure is that the books that you're using use real LSAT questions from released exams, and that those are recent exams. A lot of books on Amazon have fake reviews and use fake LSAT problems, or they use really old LSAT problems. You want to get a book from a company that specializes ideally exclusively in the LSAT, and they are using real LSAT problems from recent exams, ideally exams from the, from the 2000 and up, honestly. Anything from exam 30 and up is decent to use in a prep book if you're looking for like a textbook sort of material. Barron's is not good. Uh, LSAT for Dummies is not good. Don't use those. A lot of books, you'll, if you look, look at the reviews carefully, you'll see that a lot of them will talk about the books containing mistakes or typos or using fake LSAT problems because they just didn't want to pay the licensing fees. Definitely avoid those books. Anything from a boutique company that specializes in LSAT exclusively would be a fine way to go, though I don't really have a preference on one versus the other. And there's not just books out there, too. I mean, if you're getting the actual LSAT problems from LSAC, that's the best material you could have. The, the books of exams are published in books of 10 by LSAC for about 20 to 25 bucks each on Amazon. It's, they're, they're typically called like actual official LSAT prep tests. You get the books of 52 to 61, 62 to 71, 72 to 81. And then 82 to 87 are not in a book of 10 because there aren't 10 of them, but they're in individual booklets for about eight to $10 each on Amazon. And that's the best way to go. Beyond that, of course, you could use Khan Academy or my videos, my podcast, my courses for additional resources as well. What to do if you're applying to law school with a low GPA? Really common question. A lot of us are in that situation, unfortunately. And so if you're in that position, you're certainly not alone. My, my GPA wasn't as high as it could or should have been. And the best thing you can do at that point is honestly just get a high LSAT score to make up for it. Many people are splitters, meaning high LSAT, low GPA. This is not an uncommon situation to be in. And your GPA is what it is. If, if you're, even if you're still in college, there probably isn't too much you can do at this point to change the needle on that since you're probably a, a junior or a senior at this point. So even if you have a semester or a year to raise it a little bit, that's great. You could make a difference in that. That could be a situation where it's worth delaying law school a little bit. If you're still in college and have another semester or another year to complete, you could give yourself some time before applying to raise that average GPA a little bit and continue showing that upward trend. Otherwise, if you've already graduated, you are where you are, make the best of it by getting a high LSAT score. That's the single biggest thing you can do to improve your odds of acceptance or getting into a better law school. That's my biggest advice there. And if your GPA is crazy low, or you had a really bad semester or bad year for some personal reason, that could be worth writing an addendum to talk about why. Let's say you had a family issue or a personal crisis or an emergency of some kind, whatever it may be, it could be worth writing some kind of optional essay to explain why your GPA was low that time. And then what you did afterwards to learn, again, learn from the experience and improve going forward. You'll ask some great questions, by the way. Thank you for showing up so powerfully and engaging with me here. I know there's a lot of other things you could be doing on a Friday afternoon. And I appreciate that you chose to invest your time here with me talking about the LSAT and law school admissions. So if there's nothing else, I will leave off here. But again, thank you all for coming and for taking the time. Please feel free to reach out via email with any other questions at all. I'm happy to help however I can. So everyone have a good afternoon, good weekend, and please be in touch. Take care.
Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.